Hello, welcome to the marriage course. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a quick video overview of what we're gonna cover and if this course is for you, um, kind of framework a couple things to expect and also to understand in trying to make your marriage feel passionate, purposeful, and thriving again. Okay, so how do I know if this is for me? What's the goal? I think these are three, or uh, sorry, four big things is um, my husband taught me this one. And he used to always say, look, are you in or are you out? And I would have a but. <laughs> well, I'm in, but you need to do what I'm saying or make these changes. And I think we were both right and we were both wrong in that because being committed um, is, you know, you can say you're committed and stay stuck in the same pattern. And that is not a good place to be. So for me, at some point, I eventually had to say, look, I'm committed to upholding some of the things I'm going to teach in this course. I'm committed to this extent. To me, it was not black or white. It was not either the ring's on or the ring is off. I am committed to upholding certain standards and certain boundaries. You should think about that. Think about Think about the commitment that you or your relationship to commitment. If you're all in one more time, do all the exercises in here. This is going to give you a, a lot of clarity around what you feel like a good life should look like and if marriage is part of that or not. Because I don't personally believe that this concept that, well, you decided to get married, you exchanged wedding rings, now you need to just endure for the long run like that there is no such thing as divorce. There's times where, you know, maybe it's this course, maybe it comes to, to fruition that like, hey, we are totally different people with totally different values. Or like Victor and myself, we changed a lot in the last 25 to 30 years. And we had to basically come back to renegotiate. Is this something we want to recommit to, but with different um, different agreements? And that, that worked for us. Um, just think about it. Just contemplate. I use this word all the time. Contemplate what commitment means to you and ask yourself if you're committed to give this one more try, because I'm going to present some different things. I'm going to challenge some of your beliefs. I'm the challenger. Then I encourage you to be open-minded. Be curious to look at things differently. There is a good chance that you're running a program that was instilled um, by your parents and society and that's what's leading you to frustration right now. So there might be some old habitual thought processes that you need to let go of, but you might not even be aware of what those are. I am extremely solution oriented. I want to help you um, understand, get to the root of what the core issue is, but also framework a step-by-step -step process to get you from where you are to where you want to be. Where you are, you might not even be aware of like, what? where am I? Where, how did I get lost? How did we get here? People don't think like that. They get caught up in their emotions and they want to blame and point fingers and be angry or be aloof. And so we need to think about like, hey, how did we get here? And where exactly do we want to go? Those are solution oriented. Okay, I like to use football analogies, especially when I talk to my husband. He just loves it so much. We, you know, if you're if you're a football team, if you're a professional football team, what's the point? Are you here to win games or are you here to just enjoy practice? How many games? Is your goal to win the win the playoffs or are you just like, hey, if we make it to the playoffs, that's good? Solution oriented really takes some introspection in going back to what are you committed to? What do you want out of life? Um which brings up the last one. Hey, are you ready for the win? How great would it be to, to live a slightly idealized version? Okay, we can't be so idealistic. I mean, it would be nice if we could both partners be super idealistic and action-oriented and so self-aware that we can, we can step into this highest self, best life, dream life. But we've got a lot of programming, a lot of emotion a lot of lack of energy to to deal with. So let's talk about what that would a um, little bit more of like first with uh, signs you need this course. I've been there for lots of these. 
Frequent arguments, same argument over and over. I'd have to go to Victor. I can't, we can't keep running this pattern. We need to get to the root of this. Communication breakdown. I feel like that's one thing that's Victor and I have been really lucky about is that we, um, we highly hyper communicate, which helps, but sometimes people just, you know, shut down and turn off. Emotional distance. You feel like roommates. You lost that spark. There's not that same attraction anymore. Avoidance or indifference. Okay, I'm going to help you guys with this thing, especially if you have somebody who's like just wants to check out how to re-engage your spouse to get them to to uh, engage in the the dialogue at least. Uh, jealousy or suspicion, increased criticism or contempt. I was guilty of that one. Embarrassed about the example you were for the kids. Victor and I were like got to a point where like, man, how awful is the example we're setting for our kids? We need to be better than this. Financial secrecy, resentment or blaming, different priorities, um, feeling unheard or unappreciated, waiting for the kids to move, and then you will too. Lack of fun or enjoyment, thoughts of ending the relationship. Those are all signs that this course is going to, is for you, and I'm going to help you with these things. So some of the issues I'm going to address in this course... I know I should have done my slides differently, but that's okay. Parenting differences. Do you have disagreements on parenting styles, how you want to discipline, or your educational choices? Are there power struggles? Do you have conflicts over decision-making, control, or dominance in the relationship, especially if one partner feels overpowered or underappreciated? Intimacy, intimacy issues, a lack of physical or emotional intimacy, causing feelings of neglect or dissatisfaction? Money management issues, disagreements about how you spend money, what you're saving, what your debt looks like, or financial priorities, especially if one partner is more financially responsible or has different financial goals. External stressors, like issues like work-related stress, health problems, family pressures can spill over into the relationship, making it difficult to maintain harmony, like extended family issues can be a big problem. Okay, we're going to address these. Jealousy and insecurity. Feelings of jealousy are often fueled by insecurity or past experiences, maybe past infidelity or a lack of trust or transparency. Household responsibilities. Uneven distribution of chores or differing standards for cleanliness can also lead to resentment. Okay, so those are some things that we're going to go over in this course. Um... First, top priority for the first four weeks, though, are addressing core wounds, issues such as trauma, lack of attachment, feelings of abandonment. These can play a big role in how you are showing up in your marriage. Communication problems, misunderstandings, not being able to express your feelings, not being able to express your needs clearly, not feeling heard, feelings of disconnection, um, different life goals. You feel like your spouse has a different vision for their future, such as different career aspirations, different lifestyle choices, how you're going to raise your kids. These are what we're going to tackle in the first four weeks of this marriage course or first four lessons. Okay, I want to talk about, sorry that my face is in the way all the time, <laughs> different communication problem. This is the number one communication problem I experienced and I see in other couples. And if you do not understand MBTI, really it would benefit you to go and learn about MBTI um, in Precision Personality Hacker, it's Myers-Briggs per, uh, Typing Indicator. So four, four types we're going to talk about right here. Either you're an NJ type or an SJ type or a NP type, or an SP type. So this first slide is going to talk about the J types. This started with this because this was Victor and myself. Let's put my face back over here. I am a realist idealist, and Victor is a sentinel. This causes probably 80% of our marriage issues because it doesn't only affect how we communicate. It affects... It, it influences how we see the world and how we process the world, which basically changes all of those things that I just talked about in those two slides. It impacts um, these, these feelings, these feelings, priorities, how what we want and how we see 
but it, these things ex- a lot how we parent power struggles money intimate intimacy not so much jealousy not so much household responsibilities a lot it it, it impacts these things a ton okay so if I'm a realist idealist. I focus on the future, the big picture, meaning, significance, vision. I want theory and abstract ideas. I want respect for my perspectives and competence and appreciation for my ability to plan and project. I have a realistic projection, though, of the future as opposed to the NPs with idealism being actually my weakness because not everyone sees the world just like me, surprisingly. Uh, which is a good thing. It's a good thing. We need all these different, but I can get caught up in like, why don't you have this perfect vision of the future? And I have the weaknesses. I'm always living my life in the future and I cannot stand at repetition or reciting facts. Sentinels, SJ types, they need reliability in order to build trust. So it's important to be honest with them and follow through. They love memorization and facts. They rely on past memories to handle the present and tend tend to stick with the old way of doing things. If they're a feeling SJ type, they're driven more by others' needs, they need the affirmation, and they don't handle criticism well. If they're more of the thinking SJ type, they really want opportunities to constantly prove themselves. All right, so let's talk about the NP and SP types. Now, Victor and I aren't these, but we have children that are these. So this also is going to go into helping you with parenting. If if you yourself are an adventurer, you prefer a less structured environment. You want to think outside the box. You want to share your big ideas and far out possibilities. You're creative, but you have trouble finishing projects and sticking with tasks or assignments. You can come across as argumentative. If you're an SP, you're the dreamer. You're a hands-on learner or a life learner. You're great at observing and talking about what's going around you you, or the things that you're experiencing or learning about. You don't want to bring up the past and you have trouble projecting into the future, into possibilities, seeing the big picture. You're better with a flexible, unstructured environment and you need opportunities to be creative and resourceful. Your day-to-day and what you're doing is really important to you, okay? Sometimes, so like this SP and an SJ overall aren't going to hit heads as much. But remember, opposites attract. So you do still have, we're, we're all going to have places where it's where it's um, difficult, okay? No, no one type is better. Communication problem number two is the Enneagram. It's our core wound, core desire. This is different than what I just showed with MBTI because it's more of how we process. It's not so much, this is our shield. This is our ego defense. Um, So if one of us is running, I must be perfect, but the others, I must be helpful. Sometimes that can help, but sometimes the need to be perfect might hit heads with the need to be helpful. I must achieve. I must be unique. I must be capable. I must be loyal. I must be fun. I must be strong. I must be harmonious. These are going to cause issues. And the most important thing is to know that you're not going to change this unmet need, but you can be very aware of it and catch and go, oh, I am being too headstrong here for an eight. It's, I must be strong. Or in Victor's case as a two, I must be helpful. He's outsourcing his, his issues to just distracting himself by helping and not coming in to his own needs and addressing those. Okay, I'm not going to go into Enneagram here. We have whole courses on Enneagram. You should know yours. You should fully understand um, what yours looks like in growth. But more importantly, first, you should be able to use metacognition and see when you're running yours and be like, oh, this is that point when my Enneagram tends to do this. Okay, the third one. This Enneagram though issue plays a role. Let's put my face over here. Let's click all these through because I did it wrong. Okay. In what I'm going to show you in the next slide, it causes an energetic balance. So I want you to think of masculine, feminine. Well, just first for now, just notice if you are a one, a three, a five, or an eight, you probably tend to play a more assertive 
um, uh, have more assertive energies. That doesn't mean your role in the relationship needs to be assertive. You have just more assertion in being perfect, achieving, capability, strong. If you are the passive types, two, six, and nine, helpful, loyal, harmonious, you have pa a lot more passive energy. And if you're mutable, you can swing one side or the other, depending on your partner. So I must be unique or fun. If your you know, core desire is unique and fun, you depending, if you're with somebody who's the perfect, the perfectionist, you can end up being a little bit more of the passive um, energy. These are not roles, energies. Okay, I'm going to go and explain more in a second. So I want us to think about yin and yang, masculine and feminine energies. I think overall, contemplate it. This is just my opinion. I think in a marriage, for it to be successful, there needs to be male masculine roles and feminine roles. At least in my case, our family's success it, or would have less fighting if we were better looking back, right? We're, we're better about these now, but looking back, I think a lot of our marriage problem had to do with not understanding energy balances, the internal, our unique soul energy, yin and yang, masculine and feminine, and separating that from these are the masculine and feminine roles. Now, simultaneously, it was also our greatest gift, meaning you guys probably know me and know that I probably have a lot more masculine energy. I'm a very much logical, confident, focused, strong, stable, clear, assertive, goal-driven person. But because my husband played a masculine role in our marriage, meaning he was the breadwinner, he made money and he let me stay home with the kids, I was able in our role in our family to step into a mostly feminine energy in our or feminine role in our family. I was completely the intuitive, generous, nurturing, creative, collaborative, caring, receptive, receptive grateful. As a mom, I got to be very feminine. As an individual in like the things that I, I did in life, how my brain works, how I take action, business, um, just, my, just my natural voice was masculine. I think it helped. It was great for our family. Now flip them. Victor as an individual is much more of individually feminine energy. He uses feminine energy in his job, feminine energy in how he parents, um, feminine energy even in a lot of his own personal development, okay? Uh, how he interacts with people, I think I said that, but, but he played a masculine role in being the breadwinner and making sure he provided for our family. Okay, I know the, the yin and yang black and white one is a little bit more grainy, but I'm just going to read through the yang ones, masculine, active, external energy, assertion, valor, dominating, initiating, left brain logical, conscientious, certainty, quantity, cause and effect, hard. In excess, it can be forcing, it can be rigid, dominating, cause anxiety. I'm not, like, let's look at this with a very open mind of, could these things be playing a role? What do I think? Hopefully your spouse does this with you and sits through like a, a slide like this and goes, okay, what do we think about this? Where, like, what do we, what role do we want to play? Or, you know, is left brain logical role impeding our ability to be intuitive, right brain, and nurture our family. Who needs to be more logical here and who needs to be more in, intuitive? And maybe it's more in an energy and not so much in a black or white, this is a male role and this is a female role. Like we're on the cusp of a really cool place in the world, I think, time in the world where all of these are changing. What families look like in the future is going to change. This like, I don't even want to call it this logically driven male dominant society as a society, I think is going, isn't serving us so well. But 
how we treat this in our families, I think is going to be redefined. And all I can do is share what's worked for Victor and I and say like, hey, we have a really cool balanced family here. It's it's pretty beautiful. And I can also teach you like between gene keys and human design, there is a plan in your cellular DNA for how this plays out in your family. Okay. Wrapping it up with the yin, the feminine, patient, passive, internal energy, introspection, compassion, yielding, nurturing, bright brain, intuitive, creative, ambivalence, quality, synchronicity, soft. In excess, it becomes needy, confused, martyrdom, and depressed. Okay, I can say for a fact that Victor ends up in some of those excess yin ones, and I have ended up in those excess yang ones in my own self-development. Okay, we're so much, so much better. They can come out sometimes, depending on the level of self-growth. Again, for me, you'll hear me say this over and over, so I'm just going to keep saying you'll hear me say this over and over. For me, sitting in the gift of my gene keys has helped me so much in not going to excess in yang. When I'm excess in yang, that's my shadows of my gene keys. Okay, so that might be one step forward that you can take is doing coaching one-on-one -on -one and I can help you see where your gene keys are playing a role or where in your human design it's playing a role and really we can just make be more simple in like meditate on what that gift looks like for you contemplate what the gift of your gene keys looks like for you especially in your venus sequence if you have no idea what i'm talking about let's just move on to lesson one and get started on just simple childhood wounds and traumas that might be playing a role in making you a little close-minded and making the defense mechanism impede your ability to communicate well. All right. 